Hi everybody. So I thought I would show you all um, how I do airbrushing. I'm not. This is not a how-to airbrush, but I want to show you guys the process by which I do things, um, so that you can find your own way of doing it. But I'll show you how I do it. So this is usually this is the result I I'm I'm aiming for. So when you choose a base tone the base tone on well you're starting with a flat shape for one thing and you have to color that shape with i call it a base tone and the base tone and the background color are two things that you have to choose together they are interlinked you can't just choose one and say is this the right base tone it's like no it's dependent on the background is this the right background no it's dependent on the base tone so yeah they're interlinked and here so if I take this bright background, this white background, I am insinuating that it's a field of light. And I can apply a little bit of this light fog. I can push some of this light fog forward. And by taking the light on the, the light background on the right side and pushing that, you know, pulling that over to the left side, you know, it feels like now we've got directionality to this light. It feels that the light, this light field, um, there's a directionality to it that's going from right to left. Whereas if I undo that and I do it the other way, you know, now I can insinuate lighting is washing over the other side. So you can actually, you, this is the manipulation of the illusion that we are applying lighting. And this flat shape, every time if I do this, right, this on these sides here, right, right, let's put it right up here, right? Now I'm insinuating the light is coming from the bottom left and pulling up. So this airbrush that you use, it's, I did this in three brush strokes to, to look one, two, three, right? You're wielding a tremendous amount of power over the optical illusion. And it's not like we just move the pen around and this magic happens. So, right, that base tone. Why didn't I choose black, right? Because if you choose black, to me, black means you can't go any darker than black. And if you choose pure white, then again, you can't go any brighter than white. These are the borders of your color. And what happens is, is <clears throat> when you're trying to fold color, if you're trying to if you're trying to fold the, these flat shapes, folding can only occur so long as you can enact a change. So if I want to fold this surface, let's say I want to, I want to shade it. So I'm going to take my, yeah, shut up, auto save. <clears throat> I'm going to make my background black and I'm going to do the opposite now. I'm going to, to fold it back, right? Now, I can only fold it so far until it hits black. Once it hits black, I cannot fold it any further. Right? It won't it won't go, right? That it, it just vanishes. It becomes a lost edge. It disappears. So, this is kind of key, right? This is why I didn't choose a black base tone because I can't fold it any further. But wait. There's a trick. You can fold it further. So, if I just bring up the background just a teeny bit and I grab that background again and now I start applying this airbrush leaving it a bit of that core shadow so now I'm pulling that in there right you see it goes from background we've got a bit of a lost edge forming here lost just because it it just disappears as it blends into the background. You got a lost edge forming here, then you get the core and now it gets light again. So I'm able to continue bending it. The bending is, is achieved through change. So the moment it becomes flat, it stops bending. And like the moment your color just stops changing, it stops bending. So in this case, I actually had to bend it back. I had to bend it back, but using the background color, all right? 
Okay. So. But here's the other problem, right? Is that, again, we've reached up to that lost edge. Can we bend it any further? Well, well, of course we can. <laughs> I'm going to choose another color. Let's say there's another light source somewhere back there. Right? I can continue bending it even further. All right, so because I'm I'm continuing to enact a change, I've I've you, you can keep bending it and bending it and bending it and bending it. Right, that that that's how you make something feel really dimensional, and you've got to understand this is this is key to working an airbrush and quite possibly using any other brushing techniques. You've got to understand the purpose of color and what color does to the optical illusion and how it affects the form. This is, this is crucial. Okay. So you'll notice that I didn't start talking about what kinds of brushes I'm using and all that other crap because that stuff's boring. But now maybe you want to know, I'm going to tell you about the brushes I use. I use maybe three to four tools in total when I do this airbrushing stuff. So the first one is this bigger, big guy, this big old thing. Okay. So this is a fairly standard, um, I would call it a linear fall off brush. The reason it's called a linear fall off brush is because if you look at the fall off pattern, it's linear. It's, it's just a line. This is a linear fall off brush. Linear fall off brush. If you use, if you use it in conjunction with a, a dodge, pretty darn useful. Okay. So it's really good for subsurface scattering effects. And another thing that's extremely important is that you have easy access to changing the brush size. This is crucial. If you don't have easy access to changing the brush size, then you're just not going to change the brush size. You know why? Because it's a giant pain in the ass to change the brush size. You're going to be sitting there hitting the bracket keys in Photoshop, or you'll be like, you know, it'll just seem like a giant hassle. All right. And so in my case, I have it set up where I can just, every time I choose the tool, it automatically allows me to select the, the, the brush size. If I need to change it again, I can just click the tool again. I put this in all of my macros in, 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 in TV paint. All right. So in, in there, there's, it actually will choose the tool. It will do a bunch of script stuff. It will choose the actual tool. And then it, at the bottom there, it actually changes the size. And for those of you who are wondering, you know, where do I get the software? It's, you know, what is the software? It's TV paint or TVP animation pro. And it's like $1,500. So yeah, might as well use Photoshop, right? <laughs> might as well use whatever software it is that you've got, maybe Psy or whatever it is that you've got. Um, that's why I say, you know, don't try to follow, don't try to do exactly what it is that I do. That, that's, that's not the right mindset. You've got to find out how to do whatever it is that I do with the tools and techniques you have at hand. And you're going to have to figure out how to work those techniques. There are no shortcuts. Okay. Actually, no, you're going to keep looking for shortcuts. Everybody looks for shortcuts. I looked for shortcuts and it's good and well that you look for shortcuts because the burned hand teaches best. And after that advice about fire tends to go directly to the heart. So right. That's the linear brush. What the linear brush is really good for, the linear fall off brush is good for, is it's good for simple convex surfaces. So it's good for the center. It's good for the center of a spherical surface. It's good for the center of a cylinder. So let's just bring that size down, right? Size your brushes to the size of the job, right? This is a little job, that neck, this head, giant job. Why don't I, you know, why do I say size your brush? Because, because it'll take you a long time and you won't be able to get a nice smooth fill. I see amateurs. I see amateurs all the time using brushes that are too small for the job. So once again, I said it before, I'll say it again. Make sure you have easy access to changing the size of your brush. Crucial. Absolutely crucial. Either you set up a hotkey and you set up a game controller, which is bound to the hotkey, which which tells it to change the brush or 
you can fight with the bracket keys. All right. So next thing, next tool. The one that I was working using on the edge. This is an exponential needle fall off brush. I'm making up these terms as I go along, okay? Because it's got like this little freaking little tiny needle up there, a tiny needle needle up there. And you see, right? That's what it, that's this is this is what the brush fall off is. It's like that. It's like a little, it's like a pin fall off. What's it good for? It's good for cracks and crevices. So if I do that, right? It's good for ass cracks. So it's good for cracks and crevices, and it's also good for edges. All right. So let me tell you why this works. Why do these two brushes work? Why are they so important? It's because if you take... A circle let's see yeah you take a circle all right so if our vantage point is up here if we're looking at this thing there's our shitty eyeball okay so if we're looking straight down at this sphere here you have a very gradual fall off going this way all right this is gradual. Then it picks up and it becomes ex exponential over here, right? You get this exponential fall off in this region here. You have the gradual fall off in this zone here. Gradual here, exponential over here. That's why you need the gradual fall off brush over here in the middle. And you need the exponential fall off brush, you know, over here. And the other problem is that this exponential fall off brush, sadly, it, it falls off on both sides. So what do you do about that? Well, TV paint has a wonderful thing called drying. If you turn that off and you right click, you can use this to trim the other side. So you only need half of that. Okay. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do Let's undo that. Is there is this function called merge in TV Paint. In Photoshop, you've got the history brush. Or maybe you can get a history state. So what I've done is I just took a snapshot of this thing, threw it into the history state, and then I use this cutting tool. And I just chop it off. Right? You can make mask layers and stuff. But for every time that you have to go in there and you have to go into the mask layer and you got to tweak a bunch of settings, you're losing spontaneity. Your mind gets pulled away and then you start dealing with stupid bullshit, poking buttons, jabbing and poking buttons. And you forget about whatever the hell it was that you were working on. You can't maintain an aesthetic if your brain is focused on the craft. All right, there's, there's, there's the, the holy triumvirate of art is the craft which is all the technique and the and the whiz bang tech, techno wizardry all the software that you're using and your training and how good you are with the craft there's the craft then there's the aesthetic the aesthetic is how whether or not you can pull off the look doesn't matter what tools and techniques you use if you can't stick the landing you suck all right it's not because we are entertainers the craft is about creating optical illusions the aesthetic is about turning into entertainment all right, why does anyone want to watch the animations you make? Why does anyone want to watch, you know, look at the drawings or, or read the comics that you make? They want to because it's entertaining. And you can't be entertaining if you are, if, you're, if your mind's not sitting there. If, if your mind is not in the same state as the audience's mind, then sorry, you can't entertain. Just, it's just how it is. You, you got to get good scrub. So, yeah, you got to... You've got to have the aesthetic. Now, the third part of the Holy Triumvirate, which um, which is something that I absolutely cannot convey to you, is the payload 
or the meaning of your art. That's something you'll have to figure out on yourself on your own. That that's that is one hundred percent something that I cannot dictate to you. All right, let's get through this. Through with this. So, am I on the wrong tool? Yes, I am. Okay. All right, let's do it. Wham, bam, bam. Dodge mode using a really deep red. Practically a blood red. Because this is subsurface scattering, right? Like, if you want to convey the sense of subsurface scattering, that is light penetrating the skin, hitting the blood, going bouncing and ricocheting everywhere, and then coming back out again. So it seems kind of apt that I would choose something like a, that you should choose something like a blood red when you're doing subsurface scattering because you are subsurface scattering the blood red. You hit you're the red of the blood. <laughs> you're, 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 subs, you're subsurface scattering that, that blood and you're rocketing it back up through the skin. Uh, here's another thing. Smooth, smoothness, like using a smoothing tool. This is, again, crucial. There's a lot of gears you got to mesh together. I know you guys want me to just go zooming over everything and just make you some entertainment, but it doesn't work that way. It's because there's a lot of mesh and gears, and I'm trying to 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 take apart the whole clock and 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 show it to you. Now, one problem with these three segments, they're all the same intensity. So let's go into here. We're going to have a little bit more light hitting the top. Right, so this makes it feel like the light in the top is, is a lot stronger. Alternatively, I can put the light here in the middle. Like that. And the other thing I can do is... Tuning. So this is a custom color palette which I coded. You can see that I'm I, as I change this, I'm tuning the the color until I'm satisfied with it. Might also t tune the hue of it, make it a little bit more towards the bluish end of things. We'll keep things more orangey yellow up here though. And I'm, whenever I say orangey yellow, I just mean I'm just talking about like the, the the hue, right? Now, I think another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just grab that base tone color here, put that like that. Let's put a bit of shadow on that neck, put a bit of shadow on the upper body like that. Now we got to go in here and we got to bend things back, so. Bend things back. I'll just grab that same base tone. Right. So that's good. We get a little bit of curvature in this area here. But the curvature stopped when we hit that edge. But I'm going to keep on going. Do the other side. Get both sides before I switch. And I can go back to a dodge mode. Still using that pin fall off brush. Now, I'm going to just make sure that this stroke is exactly where I need it. Now I'm going to tune it. So, you know, how bright, how bright or how dark do I want it? Sometimes it's just enough, it's just good enough to make it show up. And maybe I'll actually go for. Something that's a little bit more blue. And then I'm going to do another color. One more hit on this, except I'm going to use an even thinner brush. This is the rim light. There. So I'll get a really, really crisp hit on the edge. And then a little bit of bluing on that. And if I want to turn, make this thing turn even more, I can put this thing into burn mode. Now, when you're using burn, you gotta you, you if, if you want to 
when you use burn, you got to use lighter colors because burn will not only darken, but it will also deepen. It deepens color. So let's get this brush nice and big. I can deepen those colors and it, again, we are bending. Now we're bending it downwards. And right, you see, I can change it so that the burning is more yellowy or more bluey. I know it's not a very technical term, but that's, that's how it is when you're doing color inflection. All right. So you can see if I go to black, that's how it works. You see, it goes black, it goes deep red. The thing is, if you just want to bend it a little bit, right, then you stay, you use brighter colors. If you want to bend it really, really deep color, you go red like that. So these are the dimensions by which you can, this bending can occur. This is why I use color burn, because color burn doesn't just make the thing fade into black. It's got hue shifts in between. And then I can also start twisting this. You see the effect it has. It's almost metallic. It's like a metallic effect. Yeah, green has no effect on this because that's a yellowish back tone. Um, that's a very yellowish base tone. All right, so let's be subtle about it. The reason why I say let's be subtle and let's not go all crazy with the amount of, with the amount of bending is because once you run out of room on the bending, once you run out of room on the values, you cannot bend it any further, right? So I just want to get enough to get the inflection of the bending. So you learn a little, you, you have to learn a thing called subtlety. Sometimes even that's enough. You know, if I didn't have to explain, this thing would go a whole lot faster. But then this would be just like every other sped up YouTube video that doesn't teach you a goddamn thing. Okay, so let's uh, let's put that into burn mode. So I'm continuing to bend. And we don't want to use something that's too red. If we use something that's too red, then it starts to look like an infection. Sometimes you just want it to show up. It's got to just be visible. Just like that. It just has to show up. And then you can... Let's see. I'm going to put in... Okay, so this is obviously too strong. I want to have a little bit of a highlight. So, again, if you wanted to go, leave me alone, autosave. Um, okay, it's a little too soon to put in the, um, the specular highlight. So let's undo that. Let's reapply. Okay, so we're going to go for, for another burn. So here's the problem with this burn. Um, I shouldn't be using the needle brush. I should be using a slightly larger brush. And the size of the brush, again, here I am using the wonderful foot pedal smoothing. And you can see how what this is doing, right? This is, you can see how it's shaping that. Now it's shaping in two directions. It's kind of nice we got a bit of a satin shade here, but we, we've got something here that I don't like, but that's, we will fix that. We can fix that. So I'm just going to get this on the other side as well. All right, so we've got the folding we want, but it's really important that you get the, um, the junctions correct, right? Areas like this crevice are, it's a very, very difficult junction. So... I'm going to go back to my hard cut tool. Let's undo these two steps. I'm going to grab a merge state of that. So I'm just grabbing the, the, the copy, throwing it into the clipboard. 
and then we can paint this clipboard back. So I'm, let's see, I can either partially just throw it in like that. Or I think that that cutting tool is a little too sharp. So instead, maybe what I'll use is I'll use um, my soft, soft airbrush and just slowly steer it back. All right, so you can see how that all kind of comes together. And then maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll grab this little bit here. You can see there's a little bit of funneling that's occurring, and then here it's it's turning into a bit of a sharp ripple edge, which doesn't look very good. So I'll take that color that's right there. I'll put this thing into darken mode. So what darken mode will do is darken will only darken what's already there, right? But it won't go any darker than that. It's called darken only mode. And then I can undo that. All right, so this is all about blending. I can put this thing into lighten mode as well. We can grab some of this and use this to flatten that out. So if you've got, um, if you've got, if you have extra like details that you don't want, so anytime you've got a color change that you don't want, that's that's an unwanted detail right so you have to have ways you have to have something in your airbrush toolbox which allows you to get rid of unwanted details to smooth things out and things like darken only and lighten only are very very effective for dealing with that and then if we look up here we can see this is a sharp edge, right? So we can lighten this. Oh, I need a larger brush. So the size of the brush is dependent on the curvature. You want to size the brush according to the size of the bend. So if I want to really bend this whole surface from here to here, I need to size the radius to cover that. And then I got to tune that. You can really see how the silhouette, right? Because I would, I hastily threw together the silhouette. There's a sharp corner there and, and you can really feel how <laughs> it doesn't feel right. Right. It feels much better over here because it's a nice smooth trans transition. So yeah, when you're creating your hard cut, your, your, um, your cutout shapes, like <laughs> you got to, you got to spend the time. In this case, I just wanted to throw together this, this demo quickly. I'm just popping that edge out. It's like an electron micrograph shade. I just wanted to show you like there. And you can see now it really feels like a wax kind of, I'm going for like a wax shader. I say shader because these are the terms you use when, or a wax material. You know, these are terms that you use in the 3D industry, and that—that's how you got to think. You got to think like a like a piece of 3D software. And Lord knows, I'm actually this actually feels kind of uncomfortable because it's like it's starting to feel like a like a nude character now, right? It's like it really. If you do your job right, I mean, it's gonna it's it's gonna start feeling like oh man, it's starting to look kind of starting to look kind of spicy, right? It's like you have to put some clothes on that. All right, what's next? And like I said, I'm not gonna take this that far. I just wanted to introduce you guys to the to the workflow. So this is the third brush that I use, which is a hard cut hard cut brush is what I use for specular highlights. So just, I'm using a smoothing tool 
like a it's a it's a brush input smoother so it's kind of like lazy nezumi but tv paint has one um i don't use it i actually have i use my hacked wake <laughs> wacom driver I use my driver hack and I use my foot pedals to, to regulate the amount of smoothing in mid stroke <laughs> and to regulate the brush size in mid stroke. It's like. How do I do this? I can't. It, it takes years to set. The, it takes a long time to set this crap up. Right. So there you get your specular highlights. You, we can even pop a specular highlight, you know, here. Learn to code. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I need to size this brush down for one thing because I'm having difficulty Controlling that. All right, let's bring that way down. Tune the brush stroke. So this tuning function that I that I'm talking about, this is um, a function which is built into this palette, and it's if I hold down the control key and I start clicking there, it undoes the brush stroke, and then it changes the color, and then it redoes the brush stroke. So it allows me to quickly see the the change in you know. It means that I don't have to keep redoing the brush stroke over and over again with a different color. This thing just automates that process. All right, let's put this thing into burn mode and let's add a little bit of... Oh, I need to get my brush pressure back in there. There. So just the slightest bit of squidge. Just a little bit of squidge. <laughs> right? Little, very, very subtle things. This is... Let's put that brush back there. Put myself back into the dodge mode. And knowing where to put the, the specular highlights, that's, that's something you're just going to have to learn on your own. I mean, I can go into a large discussion over it, but if you really want to know how, then you're going to have to be ready to render a lot of metal tea, metal tea kettles. That's, that's the only way you learn how to do specular highlights. Metal armor, metal tea kettles, tin foil, shiny shit. You're going to have to really understand why these speculars exist and why they exist right there. Burn mode. So, yeah, obviously this is, you know, way too strong. Looks infected. So you got to you know, ease up on that. Ease up on it. Maybe I use uh, a little bit of this uh, soft linear fall off type brush. So we have a slight slip core on that and then a bit of a round soft and then you go in there with a my brush and boop ah let's even this i feel is a little um overstated so what I'll do is I'm going to undo that a bit. I'm going to grab that state, redo it, and then just tap it a few times. So again, it's just enough so that it's there. You've got to learn how to tune. Like you, you, there, you have to know how to how to 
do whatever like you got to be able to do whatever it is that you just did but just not as much <laughs> to be able to adjust the opacity in stages all right and then there's other stuff we can do like if we're in dodge mode right so i have this shape cutting tool i can get a bit of an, an under reflection I don't know if this will work out. I'm tuning it. Maybe not there. Maybe I'll put a bit. So again, to get that airbrush look. You reflect, you, you're, I'm insinuating that there's a bright floor, which is reflecting up. And again, this is a thing which I'm going to tune. So that looks okay. And then once again, so now we've got this under reflection. It's like the floor has reflected and it's popping up now. Then I'm going to bring back this wonderful little needle brush. Let's, uh, let's see. I'm going to take that as a state and then let's paint it back in. Except you'll notice that I'm only putting it in here on the sides. There. Now it looks really like you get that, that, chrome reflection but just a tiny bit this is something that's very 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 classical look it meaning when you look at at like some of the old 80s it's got that 80s synth wave look right that that super chroming look and we can also put it here like yeah surprise you can actually Get that. That look. Maybe a little higher up. Man, this is <laughs> like I haven't drawn any any naughty bits or anything, but it it, it <laughs> feels very spicy. Very, very spicy. All right, let's grab a state of that. And then again, all right, I can. You paint in just a little bit, maybe just a bit up there. Uh, maybe I'll undo some of the lower state. Yeah. So keep it strong at the corners and a little up there. It's just tuning. Again, I'm not. This is not a step-by-step -step process. This is something where you know you look at the painting and you figure out which direction you want to take it and you got to know what the painting wants. Yeah. So that's pretty much the, you know, how I work the airbrush. Um I use a handful of tools, maybe four different tools, a few different blending modes. Blend uh, there's there's burn, there's dodge, regular color mode light and mode only dark and mode only um really not much not there's there's not much in terms of the tools that i use but oh and i have like the the pin fall off brush the big soft brush it, it's not you don't need to have a zillion tools you just you just gotta have you know you gotta use the one upstairs you gotta use the the tool upstairs to um to be able to do this stuff right and it like I say, you're working in optical illusion, and and um, you gotta you gotta know the aesthetic, right? So you gotta you gotta be able to stick the landing. It doesn't matter how many tools or techniques or um, stages you use. You gotta be able to stick the landing. Anyway, you get the idea.